you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Farid Borspuya. In this week's program, we have an interview with Lulandra Ra on science and education in schools and how organized religion is trying to undermine it. Mm. We'll also be talking about the UK's inquiry into Sharia courts, floggings in Iran, uh, spinsters as a security issue in Egypt, a refugee girl advocating against child marriages in a refugee camp in Jordan, a fatwa against gay sex and its effects on earthquakes, as the well as of line course, to Allah. Yeah, of course, uh, and also Ramadan and the ongoing protests to defy fasting rules and show solidarity with those who are persecuted as a result. Stay with us. The good news this week is that the British government has finally begun an investigation into not all Sharia courts, some aspects of Sharia courts that may or may not be discriminatory against women. What a... I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. Can I just say, I think yeah. the fact that the, uh, uh, the inquiry has been announced, it's an important step. Yay. That, and that's, you know, <laughs> after how many years of sort of trying to raise the issue uh, in, yeah. in, in public and through various channels um, and the campaign for One Law for All, many other people have contributed to this campaign. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the British government and Home Office has agreed to uh, uh, inquiry into yeah, this. Yeah, but I mean, what's really funny is they've got two Islamic experts on their uh, inquiry. I mean, it's like, you know, it reminds me of I having it, the, it, the midwives that uh, carry out FGM, have them on a commission to see whether FGM is detrimental for girls or not. Well, you know, if you're going to decide whether something is discriminatory against women, don't you think you should have women's rights campaigners on the commission and not Islamic experts? Absolutely. And it seems that when they were writing the, you know, the outline and framework for the inquiry, the hands were shaking. They were worried they might upset some of the um, um, Islamists. Some of their friends. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that that's the weakness of the inquiry. But the more important um, issue is that the fact that it's taking place, yeah. and that's the opportunity for everybody to um, make a comment. I mean, the, already the debate as it started uh, around the, uh, uh, the fact that the Sharia courts are discriminatory yeah. and, and the fact that they, they need to be abolished. Yeah, and also, I mean, uh, in addition, though, I think we need to raise the fact that we are against all forms of religious arbitration, also the Beth Din. It, any religious arbitration is discriminatory against women. And also that it needs to be linked in with the whole idea of social justice, legal justice. If the government keeps cutting legal aid, it's no wonder that these courts, these kangaroo courts are flourishing. Yeah. And if you want justice for women, justice for people legally, at least you do need to have one secular law for everyone and no religious arbitration. Now, what's interesting is um, I've been on a couple of interviews on this issue, debating with Islamists, and they keep going on about how this is not, you know, amputations and all. It's just, you know, dealing with family matters as if discrimination against women in the family is a trivial matter. But let's talk about some of the hudud punishments that are part of Sharia's criminal code. Uh, for example, what's happened in Iran recently. Yeah, mov moving on from the, uh, uh, from the um, review of Sharia course in Iran. In Iran, re on a daily basis, the Islamic Republic of Iran, under the Sharia, issues various kinds of punishment. One of them is actually flogging. Um, and that's part of the Islamic code. Uh, workers who go on a strike um, and or they uh, organize petition for higher wages. They are routinely flogged or imprisoned. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to give you news, there's now 17 gold mining workers who have been given between 30 to 100 lashes merely for organizing. Um, and there's also another well-known labor leader, Jafar Azimzadeh, who's now on hunger strike because he's been sentenced to six years in prison for organizing again, um, uh, around, around better fun, wages. Better wages organized a petition of 40,000 people to demand better wages. And I think that brings the question that Sharia is 
Um, of course, the, the first line of attack is womanism, and women's rights, but it's detrimental for the rest of the society. The working class and the trade unions need to pay particular attention if the Sharia and the Islamists sort of get, gain more power. You know, they're, they're, they're different parts of the society and the right rights of different sections of society would be undermined. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is that it is a, a sort of totalitarian, it is totalitarianism. I mean, controlling every aspect of people's life. There's news just recently of 35 young uh, boys and girls who have been sentenced to almost 3,500 lashes uh, altogether because they were uh, celebrating a gr their graduation, of course, dancing, uh, supposedly unveiled. And this is the limits, you know, the extent to which, I mean, not limits, the extent to which they're willing to violate rights in order to keep their rule. Yeah, and, and uh, militarization or making every day's people life somehow criminal is part and parcel mm -hmm. of this. We hear, for example, in Egypt, uh, uh, even being, um, you know, single uh, uh, for for, for women, it's it's now is is treated as a security issue yeah. for the for the country. Yeah, they they're saying people who are over thirty or thirty and above who haven't gotten married, spinsters, they are a national security issue now for Egypt because there are so many women who haven't gotten married, and it is destabilizing for the family and country, which is utter nonsense as usual. Yeah, and all of this is part and parcel of the retreating from the basic human rights. And Sharia contributes heavily to this retreat. And those um, governments who are very clear that they want to roll back the states and remove the fundamental rights, that's why they have so much interest to maintain Sharia and Sharia can in different forms depend in different society depends on level of resistance. Yeah, I mean we talked about this in the last program too in an interview with El Hamania. It, it's very clear whether it's in Britain, whether it's in Iran, whether it's in Afghanistan, whether it's in Saudi Arabia. Sharia law, religious law, is inhuman, it's discriminatory, it doesn't belong in the 21st century, full stop. A while back, I met with Lilandra Ra when she was visiting Britain. Listen to an interview I did with her on science and uh, the educational system and how important it is to be able to have a system free from religious indoctrination and interference. Stay with us. Hi, Lilandra Ra. It's lovely to have you on our program. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you as a first question something you've said quite a number of times before, which is that religion is harmful for education. Can you explain why? As a science teacher, uh, I've had experiences with students teaching in Texas where uh, I'm like, today we're going to learn where mountains come from. And you'll get a student who'll say, uh, I don't need to know that because, um, because I were, cause God made them. And so it makes them, in, a lot of students, incurious. And uh, that's part of the anxiety they're passing on from their parents, who are afraid that if uh, that science explains everything, then the Bible doesn't explain it. Like uh, Genesis and, and the creation myths. They're, they're worried that if they learn about evolution, that they'll leave their faith. And that is a, a really huge concern with a lot of Christians, that losing their children to atheism or secularism. So specifically with regards to science, as you mentioned, you're a science teacher, you do teacher training as well. Mm -hmm. What are some of the areas in specific where religion is having such a harmful role? If you can expand on it, I know you mentioned evolution, for example. Um, I've taught in a Christian school before, and, and the workbooks are all geared to sell intelligent design. Like, for example, a lesson will have a butterfly and say, this, this egg, butterfly egg, always hatches into a butterfly, nothing else as if science is saying that butterflies poof into something else, but actually Genesis is saying that dirt poofs into Adam and Eve, you know? So uh, there, there's that. They're always, they're always trying to say it is a, it's a hundred and some years after Darwin, and they're always trying to say, no, that's not how it happened. It still happened by magic. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, in Texas and a lot of other, a lot of other states in the United States, and now that the national government is is becoming more religious pandering, 
there's a there's like even Donald Trump uh, when he came to Dallas he said well America's going to be able to say Merry Christmas again like we they couldn't say it before like they're being so restrained by atheists so uh, the point I'm making though is that that the uh, Republicans in in Texas legislature which I I know a lot about because I live in the state are always uh, uh, gearing a lot of legislation toward telling people what they can say in the classroom, what what they can't, trying to get intelligent design and creationism in the classroom. Rick Perry was like, well, um, I told a little kid, well, I think creationism should be taught in the classroom. So we have people, this public decision makers, who are very geared and very, very supported by Christian lobbies to uh, undermine science education, not just science education, history education too. Like uh, recently, uh, the new history textbooks uh, credit Moses with uh, the founding of the United States government. Uh, not him uh, alone, but he has no credit whatsoever. In, in a list of people like Thomas Jefferson and the founding fathers, Moses is not <laughs> a, a credible or relevant to uh, American history at all. And that's then our, our students are learning about that. What do you say to people who say, well, what's wrong with them learning about that? It's just one, you know, science is one way of looking at the world. That's another. Uh, well, science is the uh, only way that humans currently have of verifying the accuracy of wh what they're learning. Um, other, other academic disciplines also have some, uh, like history, uh, a lot of times people have less will go, well, if Moses in history, is that a, a really big deal? But to me, it is. The truth is the truth. And how do you know what the truth is? You're able to verify it. So if if you're going to put, for example, Moses in history books and, and every major historian is, is disagreeing with you when they look at primary sources and secondary sources and evidence, whether that's so, archaeology is a science. Uh, so... Uh, it, that if they're going to say, well, I, and I've had a principal tell me that before. Like, uh, my son was in an after-school program and, uh, and run by a Baptist minister, and I was walking by, and, and, and he's shouting at the kids, J just say, uh, God made a dinosaur, and, and let there be dinosaurs, and that's where dinosaurs came from. So I go to tell the principal this, and she goes, well, uh, and I go, I told him that you're undermining the the science curriculum saying something like that and she goes well that you have your opinion and he has theirs but science is not a matter of opinion it's a, it's a matter of verifiable fact so if you're going to say that why don't you let them say that and you have your opinion and they have theirs it's not like we're having a discussion over the grassy knoll or some kind of how kennedy uh, was shot opinion uh thing we're we're having a, a discussion of what we should teach children. And evidence-based uh, information is the only current method, nothing that they've offered in a, as, a, as a counter to that ha is as accurate, like intelligent design. I mean, intelligent design was a, tr a way to try and take some of the best things of science and put a, put a, um, a a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, there, there's nothing even. They say that uh, irreducible complexity is is some kind of scientific evidence of creationism, but they don't have any mechanisms or anything that really helps you to understand how that happened. Whereas evolution has all kinds of like evidence, like in different f different areas. Uh, DNA uh, evidence, uh, morphological evidence, geological evidence. It, it's backed by multiple disciplines. And that's not so for intelligent design. What about the politics? You've been talking about that too, but what, what's your concern with, let's say, Trump, if he becomes president, the, the rise of the Christian right and its role in, in the US? You talked about Christian lobbying. Where do you see that? Um, uh, a lot of Christians even don't see Trump as someone who's actually a Christian. When he was speaking to Liberty uh, University, he said, uh, he said, uh, he quoted two Corinthians, and all Christians know that's Second Corinthians. 
So he's not somebody that's biblically literate. And, and some Christians, evangelical Christians, will still choose him over somebody who has huge credibility as an evangelical Christian like Ted Cruz. And his family is established uh, uh, evangelical Christians. And because they say that sometimes God uses a, 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 a non-Christian in the Bible to accomplish his ends and stuff like that. But, but then some other people will argue, well, as a secular person maybe I, and a conservative, maybe I can vote for Trump because he's not for real. With his, uh, with his Christianity, but I got to tell you, just like he came to, to Fort Worth and told them that we're going to be able to say Merry Christmas now, he has some, some promises to keep for all these Christians who are backing him. So he's going to do uh, what he's, what he's uh, promised a lot of them to do so he can stay in office. Uh, so I, he, won't be, he wouldn't be as bad as, as Ted Ted Cruz would be as far as theocracy goes, but he's still not going to govern from a secular perspective. He's going to govern for what his self-interest is. And But I do believe him, however, on his genuine racism. I do believe that he's coming from a genuine place with that. Because uh, having grown up in the South, uh, I know a racist when I see one. And uh, unfortunately, he's pandering to uh, a fearful and hateful uh, part of America. Not everybody in America is like that, but are enough people, there are enough people to elect him for president or enough people that think he's not serious and uh, aren't really, are low information. Uh, there, are, there are a whole other, lot of other things to be afraid of Donald Trump being president uh, other than his Christian pandering. But I, I believe he did promise that he would try to overturn uh, the SCOTUS decision on gay marriage. So, like, perhaps by appointing judges, he might help Republicans uh, get a, a marriage amendment in the Constitution. So that would be very hard to come overcome. Thank so, you. You're welcome. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Lilandra Ra. I think, I mean, it's, it's very clear that education is so crucial in leveling the playing field for children, in giving them the opportunity to think critically. And the thing about religion is it doesn't let you think critically. It tells you what you must think. And it's so dangerous when it comes side by side with the educational system. It can be really very, very detrimental. Absolutely. And it's such an important area that everybody has an interest. You know, people who um, want children to flourish, they want them to actually learn, to be critical and have the uh, critical mind. Um, you know, they want uh, you know, a curriculum that uh, addresses these issues. But there are some people who don't want this. Yeah. They want fixed um, ideas because they want they don't want people to question in society, and that's what what, what it is. And you, what we'll see more and more, and Lilandra refers to this, how creationism, for example, is not just uh, they're just debating different ideas. Mm -hmm. They are they as an organized religious force are interfering in children's education mm -hmm. and trying to actually undermine and move away from proper teaching of science. Mm -hmm. A, a Muslim cleric in Ghana, this is where our insane fatwa of the week comes from, has said that um, Allah is annoyed at gay sex and that's why he is causing earthquakes. Annoyed? Yeah. How does he know? He's very annoyed. How does he know? He's got a direct line to Allah. He's, he knows. And He's, he knows that and Allah speaks to him and nobody else? Wait, I, I'm getting a call. <laughs> Where's my antenna? <laughs> I'm getting a call from Allah. You have a line, direct line as well. And Allah's telling him, it's shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Allah is so rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it's it? It's amazing, so, you know, <laughs> they just got, uh, they've got it in for everybody, you know. Uh, Everyone that does anything fun and nice and... Or n normal human normal. life. This is just normal, having sex is normal. Yes, and they, they But they it causes like earthquakes. It.
Oh, earthquake! Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't get that. <laughs> yeah. Earthquake as well. It's earthquakes. Yeah. So when that's uh, why there's earthquakes because he's annoyed. And so he whenever knows. there's earthquake, forget about everything else. Run around and find it. No, no, stop having gay sex. Oh no! And you find Allah. Is, he, is, this, is this okay? No, this is wrong. <laughs> Allah is insane. connecting this guy. Insane, insane. He's contacting this guy. <laughs> insane. <laughs> it's crazy. <gasps> The slice of life this week is about 15-year-old Omama Hosham. She is a Syrian refugee in a Jordanian camp and she is campaigning against child marriages. And this is beautiful. She was inspired by Malala and when she saw her young friends disappear and get married and some of them didn't come back to school, uh, she was worried and then she started campaigning and now she works for United Nations High Commissioning for Refugees and as Save the Children, isn't and it? And Save the Children, children as, uh, as a volunteer. And she uh, uses drawing and discussion in classrooms with young ch children why young children should be married. And it's she's running really, a really an inspiring uh, work that she's doing. And congratulations to her and all of those who are working with her. Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. We, of course, are coming up to Ramadan soon, and of course, we need to remember all of those who are persecuted for defying fasting rules. We need to remember them, show solidarity with them during this month ahead. And this is an important uh, campaign because millions of people for a whole month are under severe pressure in the Islamic ridden societies, and we need to recognize this um, issue and campaign for everybody to have the right to live as they wish. Yes. Anyway, we hope to see you again at the same time and same place. And next week, until then, have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.